No, it's going to be great. Uh, I'm actually super excited about closing out this series because uh, several weeks ago I got to uh, start the series and kick it off. And uh, one reason I'm really excited about finishing this series the way we are is because uh, the team, um, long before I knew what this series was going to be about, they had already planned it. And they had already picked out the passages of scripture we were going to use each week and what the theme and what the anthem is. And they had assigned me, literally not kidding, one of my favorite moments uh, in the gospels between Jesus and a guy. And what was really special for me was the first time I ever got asked to guest speak at Forest City was uh, about three years ago. And they said, preach on whatever you want. And this is literally, this is how much I love this story. This is literally uh, what I chose to preach on that first time. Now, I know a bunch of you, you weren't here. And if you were here, you don't remember a word I said. So it's going to be fresh and it's going to be new. Um, but we are going into uh, week number four of this uh, series on hospitality. And I said this in week one, and uh, I, I want to remind us of this. When you hear the word hospitality, um, it's not the first word that jumps off the page when you think about the kingdom of God and you think about all the things about about Jesus and the kingdom of God and what we're called to participate in. You don't hear hospitality and you, you think, man, that's, that's worth four weeks. Like that's a, that's a big one. But when you really look at the full story in the scriptures and in history, and you look at the heart of God through history, you start to realize that biblical, now that I got to add that because it, it's so much more than just uh, having someone over for dinner and giving them a meal, right? Biblical hospitality is Jesus followers approach, not only to friends and family, that's a form of hospitality, right? But even more importantly, it is our hospitable spirit that we show the stranger and we show the outsider and we show the marginalized. That to me is evangelism 101. It's not getting up and preaching. It's not Billy Graham and on everyone. That has its place in the kingdom of God and that has its effect uh, in, in ways that are beautiful. But for most of us who aren't Billy Graham, none of us are Billy Graham, right? For most of us, evangelism and, and, and reaching people and being a part of people's lives for the glory of Jesus Christ, it is so much more simple than sometimes we think it is. And so I hope in week four that I just kind of bring us back and as we close this out to reminding us that if you you are a follower and a lover of Jesus Christ and you are currently still breathing, you absolutely qualify to be an evangelist for Jesus Christ. And one of the greatest tools that we have been given to do that is this gift of hospitality. Our theme verse is John chapter 13. We've been reading it every week and this is where we build from. Jesus was talking to the disciples and he said this, he says, hey, a new command I give you which I love, right? Like this should not have been a new command. This is like obvious, right? You'd think at least. He says, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And then he says, here's why. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. It's not that complicated. But you know what makes it complicated? We're humans. Humans can be really hard to love sometimes. You could talk to my wife. She'd say, yeah, I love that guy, but he's really hard to love sometimes, right? And Jesus says, this is how we are going to distinguish ourselves from every other person on planet Earth is if we love every other. Uh, if, excuse me, if we love each other. Now, I'm going to do this. I love, as you guys know, if you've been going here very long, I love to tell stories. And I don't apologize for telling stories um, because it seemed to be Jesus' favorite method of teaching. You guys realize that, right? He taught in other ways. Uh, he gave commands. He gave principles. He gave encouragement. But some of the greatest kingdom uh, ways that he taught with principle was through parable and was through story. And so I've just always loved telling stories. So here's what I'm going to do with our time today. I'm going to tell you three stories. I'm going to start by telling you a story just like I did in week one. I told you a story about uh, towards the end of the message about my neighbor Cliff, right? Well, I'm going to start by telling you a story about when we moved out of that house and moved into our next house, our next neighbors. I'm going to start there and then I'm going to tell you a story, which I talked about earlier, one of my favorite stories in all the gospels about Jesus and a guy named Matt. Matt was in the tax world. Is it tax season, right? We just had tax season. Yeah. So we already don't like Matt. Um, he was in the tax world, and then I'm going to finish by telling you a story about a 17-year-old kid who God graciously brought into me and my family's life about a year and a half ago, and his name is 
Ian. So I'll start with my neighbors. Uh, after we moved from the house that I talked about four weeks ago with the cliff story, we moved into a house because we just kept having babies for whatever reason and we needed, a, we needed another room. So uh, we upsized the house a little bit. We moved into this neighborhood and uh, the day we were moving in, it was like a week before Thanksgiving um, and we're moving in. We got the truck and I was seeing no neighbors out and I was kind of wondering, you know, who we're going to be living by. And then at one point, uh, the first neighbors to come out were the neighbors directly across from us on the other side of the street uh, to introduce themselves. We would go on to become incredible friends. It's a really special story to me. Their name is Scott and their name is Sam. But when I went over to talk to them while we were moving, uh, this was, I don't remember, 10 years ago or so. Uh, this is what I looked like. Go ahead and put that picture up. I don't know how those groans, I don't know how to take that, but... <laughs> That's what I looked like when I moved into that neighborhood and when I got introduced to Scott and Sam. Scott and Sam are older than me. They're in the business world, extremely successful uh, people. And then this joker moves in across the street from them, right? And so uh, I was wondering what they were thinking, but we had an incredible talk. And at one point, their son who was home from college because Thanksgiving was coming up, he came out and I got introduced to him and we had a great little talk. And then I went back to moving in and, and I, I, I didn't see him until a couple weeks later, but what I found out a couple weeks later was uh, hilarious to me um, because when they went in the house, they go, oh, you know, the, the dad, Scott, he goes, he seems like a really nice guy. This could be a, a good neighbor. And then his son goes, dad, yeah, he seemed like a cool guy, but this is, this is Colorado, dad. I guarantee you that guy smokes so much weed. Did you see what he looks like? <laughs> Because you guys know Colorado, like they were the first adopters of, of, of the, 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 the funny stuff. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and he's like, he's probably a nice guy, but he's probably that nice and that talkative because he's probably high right now, dad. And he's like, his dad's like, no, he just seemed great, right? And so they just laughed about it and moved on. But one thing that happened that week, I love Jesus so much. They hadn't been in church for over a decade as a family. And during Thanksgiving, when their kids came back from college, they had had a talk about missing church and some of their memories from over a decade ago about going back to church. And so they decided before the kids went back to school on Thanksgiving, uh, Sunday after Thanksgiving, that they would go to a church. And so they just Googled some churches. And the first church that came up on the Google search engine was the church that I was the pastor of. <laughs> and so... Less than a week after getting introduced to them and them thinking I'm the new local drug dealer, <laughs> they go to our post-Thanksgiving service, and as the worship's ending, I walk up on stage with my, you know, try, you know looking like, yeah, just a poor version of Jesus, you know, <laughs> white Jesus, like not good. I walk up there, and they said they are just jaw drop, like, right, like what? Wait, and my, my friend Scott said he looked at his son and was like, see? <laughs> judgmentals. That's the man of God right there. Right? Like, <laughs> and I'm like, well, give me time, Scott, before you say, right. But, 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 but what we laughed about that. And what I thought was so awesome is they ended up never leaving that church to this day. They ended up getting into a life group eventually, which was a big step for them. You know what they do now? Lead a life group. Like that was the full circle of, right. And you know what it did? It, it started by, what's the old quote? We've all heard it. We can all quote it. In fact, I'll say the first part, you finish it. Don't judge a book, right? It was one of those don't judge a book by its cover. You thought I was the drug dealer, but I was actually the local pastor. You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes they're both, and that's another sermon for another day. <laughs> we'll call that out. But it's don't judge a book by a cover, and this is what I love about Matthew 5. It's one of those quintessential don't judge a book by its cover. So let's read. Let's go to the story of Matt and Jesus. Matthew chapter nine, verses nine. I'm reading in the, the, the message paraphrase because I, I, it's so beautifully written. It says, passing along, Jesus saw a man at his work collecting taxes. His name was Matthew. Jesus said to Matthew, hey, come along with me. Don't you love that? Never met before, just walking along. And what's Jesus do? Hospitality. He, in, he invites. Hey, you wanna come hang? You want to be with me? And here's what it goes on to say happened. Matthew, I love this because he was at his tax collecting booth, collecting taxes, got up and followed him. He quit his job on the spot. You ever done that? I have once. Didn't go well. But I, I just thought that, like, what is it about this man, Jesus, that he could just walk by 
Who, by the way, and we'll talk about this for a couple minutes because context, historical context matters so much to the power of this story. If you don't know historical context to what is happening here, this story isn't really that impressive. It's just another moment with Jesus, right? Passing by, hey, come follow me. But here's what you gotta understand. Because Matthew was a tax collector in first century Judea, they were the worst of the worst. The apostle Paul would put them in the category of scum of the earth. You understand that? Let me give you a little background, if you're, especially if you're newer to the scriptures or this story uh, today. Let me give you some background because this matters. Uh, Matthew was a Jewish kid who sold himself out against his people to be in cahoots with Rome. And what Rome would do, because they, they ruled the known world back then in, in the Middle East back there, what they would do is they would hire the locals to collect the taxes that everybody owed Rome. And what they would do for the people collecting taxes, and they were already overtaxed. You, you, you know what I'm talking about? You ever feel that, right? They were overtaxed, overworked, underpaid, underthanked. Rome was, to some degree in first century Judea, really oppressing the Jewish people. It was not an easy life except for a, a small group of people in the Jewish culture called the Pharisees and Sadducees and the teachers of the law. Other than them, nobody had any power. Nobody had a voice. Other than them, nobody really had any cash or any money. And Matthew sold himself out against his people. You ever been sold out by someone? It's painful, right? It just digs extra deep. He sells himself out. He gets in cahoots with Rome. And what Rome would say is, in order for you to make money, here's what we're going to let you do. And you have our backing behind you. After you get the taxes that we've required, you can extort and ask for as much more tax as you see fit. And you will be backed by Rome. Nobody can do anything about it. So now you've got a person from your community, your nationality, your people, like this was a, not, not a big town at the time. People would have grown up with Matthew. People would have went to school with Matthew if they had however school worked back then, right? People as kids, middle school, high school, elementary school would have played with Matthew, built relationships with Matthew, known Matthew's family, known Matthew's cousins, known Matthew's friends. And, and something happened in life and we don't know what happened in life, but something happened in life where Matthew got either so fearful or so desperate or so greedy that he said, I'm gonna sell my people out. And he spent his adult life until he met Jesus extorting and being fraudulent with the people that he grew up with. That, that's rough, right? In fact, this is how much tax collectors were hated. Multiple times in the gospels, they get singled out, right? There's tax collectors and what? Sinners. Like that's bad. You know, the Bible says we're all sin, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? But we're justified freely by the grace and redemption that comes through Jesus Christ. It's bad, though, when everyone's like, yeah, we're all sinners, but we're not tax collectors at least, right? At least we can feel better about ourselves because we're not them. They were saying in that culture, and you can, you can add that. We, we all got our person. We all got our people group that we call the tax collectors of our day. Let's not get too holy in church right now. If we're not really careful with our hearts for a city, we all have, we, we know as Christians, yeah, we're all sinners. But if we're not careful, so man, those Democrats, there's sinners and then there's Democrats. There's sinners and then there's those Republicans, you know. There's sinners and then fill in the blank, you know. We all got our people that we have to guard our hearts against because Jesus, our founder, our Lord, our master, never did that. So here's the implication of this story. This is, this is not some cute Sunday school story where, hey, Matt, come and follow. And then he follows and everything goes on. And like, oh, that's cute. The minute Jesus said, Matt, you want to follow too? All the people who were following him that day, a bunch of them probably left. A bunch of them probably looked at Jesus and said, I love you. I love the miracles you do. I love the teachings you do. But if you bring him in, I'm out. If you bring Matt into the club, that's a deal breaker for me. You ever been there? Like I can do life with, now here's what's even more interesting. This is really interesting to me. If you read the gospels, the first four disciples that Jesus invited and said, you want to follow me? Do you know what they were by trade? We know this, come on. Fishermen. And you know what? They were family. Peter and Andrew, brothers. James and John, brothers. They were family. And you know what? They all did the same thing. They all dressed alike. They joked alike. They talked alike, right? Right? They had everything in common. When Jesus picked those first four fishermen, life group was easy. But then guess what happens with disciple number five? 
He's their arch enemy. Did you notice where he's collecting taxes? On the Sea of Galilee. Do you know what that meant back then? They didn't just collect coin for currency. They collected fish on the sea for taxes. You know what those guys did to make a living and to feed their kids? Fish. And now Matthew's coming and extorting a bunch of their hard work from them that day. Maybe, I'm just, I'm just speculating here, but there's a good chance there were some days where Peter or Andrew or James or John's kids maybe didn't get a meal that day because Matthew took all the fish from them. And Jesus has the audacity. This is, uh, hospitality sounds so nice and light. Hospitality, when it's done Jesus's way, is audacious for a city. It's inconvenient. I'll go as far as to say, based on this story, it's scandalous. When we're doing it, Jesus, it's so much more than just being kind and inviting people in and breaking some bread. It's not just inviting people in, it's who we're inviting in. It's not just welcoming friends and family in, it's who we're welcoming in. If we don't invite the stranger, who will? World ain't about that. But Jesus and his kingdom is, if we don't invite the, inside, the outsider in, who will? World isn't about that. We keep them out for a reason. If we don't invite the marginalized, who will? Like, and this is what Jesus is showing us in this moment with Matthew. The minute he invites Matthew to the crew, he completely ruins life group. I can't believe Peter and Andrew and James and John didn't walk away that day, didn't say, hey, hey, this is a, a deal breaker for me. But then I want you to see what happens next in the story. What, what's Matthew, this is so beautiful, what's Matthew's very first reciprocation to Jesus when he says, hey, you want to come and follow me? That invitation of hospitality. Do you know what Matthew's response is back to him? This is the power of letting Jesus in, guys. Don't miss this. His very first reciprocation to Jesus was what? Hospitality. He says, you want to come to dinner at my house? Right? Listen to what it says. Later when Jesus was eating supper at Matthew's house with his close followers, listen to this, a lot of disreputable characters came and joined them. Why? Because it was Matthew's crew. That's who he had hung out with up to that point. Now, when the Pharisees, I wrote in my notes, right? We've talked about this before. These are the pros of piety if you're new to church. The Pharisees were professionals at behavior. Now their hearts, at least during Jesus's time, had gotten far from God. Behaving better than everyone else, do you know what it was in their, in their time? Big money. It brought them esteem. It brought them power. It was money for them to behave better than everyone else. They had made their whole life about being the best at behavior. And, and, and here's where we got to check our hearts for a city. It says, when the Pharisees, the pros of piety, I say, saw him keeping this kind of company, what did they do? This is a religious spirit right here that we got to confront. And, and here's the beautiful thing. Uh, I don't believe this spirit is at all in Forest City. But here's the deal. If we don't continue to hold ourselves accountable, we can find ourselves falling into this trap over time. When the Pharisees saw him keeping this kind of company, they had a fit and they did what? They lit into Jesus's followers and they said, what kind of example is this from your teacher? Acting cozy with crooks and riffraff. I don't have a clue what riffraff means, but it sounds bad. Acting cozy with crooks and riffraff. And let, let me just stop there and give us a, a thought about biblical hospitality that is so important. When we are talking, when we are challenging ourselves as a church and as individuals to be the best on planet earth at welcoming the outsider, the stranger, the marginalized, the Matthews of this world that everybody calls enemy, the Matthews of this world that everybody has chalked up to no good, that everybody doesn't want to get near, that everybody doesn't want to touch. What, what, we should be the best on planet earth, just like Jesus was, at inviting those people in with such grace and with such compassion. But what are the, what's the religious spirit do? They have a fit because Matthew doesn't match the behavior that they're promoting to everyone, right? And I wrote in my notes here, and we'll put it up on the screens. This is important. Biblical hospitality is not an endorsement of someone's behavior or lifestyle. It is an endorsement of their humanity. Jesus was amazing at this, right? The Apostle Paul would tell us this incredible advice. He said, be in the world. Don't hide from it. Don't hide from the troublemakers. Don't hide from your enemies. 
Don't hide from the people that you disagree with and don't like and are fundamentally opposed to. Don't hide from them. He says, be in the world, but then what's he finished by saying? But don't be of it. In other words, we have to learn the art that our rabbi and master Jesus knew perfectly, which was there is a very healthy, beautiful way to be in this world ministering and evangelizing and reaching out to people without being corrupted by it in the process. Now, of course, you got to be careful. Paul would go on to say sometimes when you're restoring somebody in their own sin, be careful that you yourself aren't tempted. It can go the opposite way. So of course, I want to balance that by saying we have to be wise, but this is Jesus giving us the green light. Jesus did not endorse Matthew's fraudulent behavior. His going to dinner at Matthew's invitation was not an endorsement of Matthew's uh, lifestyle up to that point. You understand that, right? But you know what Jesus is saying? If we're going to bring heaven to earth, somebody's got to go eat with the person we all don't like. If heaven's going to come to earth, we can't all blockade ourselves away from the troublemakers and the people that bother us and the people that we're afraid of or the people that we think are ruining the world. If we just blockade ourselves off from them and wait for Jesus to return, what are we here for? Then just return Jesus. But the Bible says it's God's will that nobody perishes. And so true biblical hospitality is always starting with the fact that people are human. Not if they're saved, unsaved, sinner, saint. Biblical hospitality is not an endorsement of anybody's behavior or lifestyle. It's recognizing that when a newborn baby is born, we don't know if they're going to be saint, sinner, somewhere in between. We don't know if they're going to be good. Some people, unfortunately, even live their lives that go to the realm of evil. Like people can do some really evil things, right? But the truth is, is, and it's been this way since the Garden of Eden, and it will never change, every baby that comes out of that mother's womb is immediately by default an image bearer of the living God. The Imago Dei, right? They're image bearers. Now, here is what the kingdom is all about. It's not enough in this life to be an image bearer of God, to just be born. Well, I'm an image bearer of God. No, no, no. What does Jesus come and teach? There's a second birth, right? It's not enough to be an image bearer of God. What's the most important birth is what? Where Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you will not receive eternal life. You will not receive all the beauty. You think hospitality on this side of earth is beautiful. Just wait till heaven, y'all. It's going to be endless and it's never going to stop and it's going to be perfect and it's going to be effortless. I can't wait for that. You think you eat good now? Just wait. There's no calories in heaven. It's going to be beautiful for a city. Let it be, Lord. Come soon, Jesus. What was the word they used? Uh, uh, Maranatha. Maranatha. Perhaps today is what that meant. Let it be today, Jesus, right? But until then... We are getting permission for it. I love this. I get, you can tell I'm passionate. This is why I love this story because I bleed this about the kingdom of God. This is something I am so passionate about trying to learn to be one of those people. And again, sometimes I feel like a freshman. I got prejudices just like you do. I got people groups just like you do. I got, I got individuals that rub me the wrong way, just like you do. I even, I don't have too many. I've been blessed that way. I don't have too many en- enemies. You got to do a lot to, to be an enemy of mine. I'm just a ch- pretty chill guy. I like people. But I'm just like you. I, I, I know what that's like. But this excites me. Because I'm like, Jesus has given us permission. Like, no, 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 no. You, I'm going to Matthew's house. And I don't care what the religious spirit says. I don't care what the Pharisees say. I don't care if they have a fit. Because I did not come here to call the healthy. I came here for the Matthews. And here's the cool thing about Jesus is the reason biblical hospitality is so significant to who we are and what we do as Christ followers is because Jesus knows the end of things from the beginning, right? When Jesus said, hey, Matt, you want to follow me? And everyone's ticked at Jesus and confused. Like he's our enemy. Nobody's potentially hurt us more than this guy, Matthew. And now you're inviting him into our club, our life group. How could you do that, Jesus? But nobody knew what Jesus was privy to knowing. The end from the beginning, right? Nobody knew that eventually Matthew would become a passionate follower of Jesus because of the love and hospitality and invitation that he received. Matthew would not only become a passionate follower of Jesus, but what book are we reading from today, guys? 
the book of Matthew, 2,000 years later in Rockford, Illinois, this knucklehead, fraudulent, scheming, no good, scum of the earth, Matthew gets an invitation that would change his life from Jesus himself, and it is a game changer. Do you know why Jesus, without worrying about the religious folk getting mad at him and judging him or wondering how a rabbi could dare eat with a tax? Do you know why he so easily did that with so much poise and grace and hospitality is because he knew, hey, guys, you don't know this yet, but Matt's going to change the world. He's going to write a book that's going to be a part of the compilation of the single best-selling book in the history of the world. And the second place book doesn't even come close to the first place book when it comes to the best-selling book on planet earth of all time. You understand that? Doesn't even come close. And Jesus, Jesus is like, yeah, you just, you just got to trust me. One invitation. And then what's Matthew do instinctually? He's already being healed. From one invitation to Jesus, there was something in this scheming guy's heart that said, oh, I'm gonna do the most kind, sacred thing you could do in that culture. I'm gonna have him into my home. Yeah. It wasn't easy to have a dinner for people back then. You think it's hard for you now? It's, it was not easy to host a dinner back then. And Matthew says, and, and Matthew, I love it, unapologetically invites all his scheme and tax collecting friends with him. Didn't even think about the implications. And Jesus says, hey, this is, this is how we change people's lives. This is evangelism. We've overcomplicated it because we see the crusades. We see the Billy Graham moments. We see the, we see the big church moments where, where people are, you know, and we assume, oh, that's for the pastors and the churches to do. And Jesus is like, no. Billy Graham reached several million people. That blows my mind, right? With his crusades. And that is a gift from God that I will forever honor and cherish. But there are 7 billion people on earth right now. That is a drop of water in a very big pool. You understand that? What Billy Graham did. More than all of us, right? Praise God, let's honor him and thank him and all the people that went before him. But the way the world gets changed is by you and I being willing to take a chance on someone that in your gut and in your instinct says, I'm not sure I want to or think it's smart to take a chance on this person. But I say for city, if not us, Jesus's followers, then who? Like this gets me excited now. And the more you do it, the more it brings up beautiful things. And so they, they, they threw a fit. Jesus goes on to say, it says this, Jesus overhearing them throwing a fit about why he was dining with Matthew. I love this, shot back. That's another sermon for another day when Jesus claps back. That's a, well, but Jesus shot back. Who needs a doctor? The healthier, the sick. Go and figure out what this scripture means. And then Jesus would have quoted what the Pharisees would have had memorized by heart. Hosea chapter six, verse six. I'm after mercy, not religion. So don't you worry who I dine with. Don't you worry about why I'm willing to invite Matthew into life group when he hasn't earned it, he hasn't deserved it. In fact, by human standards, he has disqualified himself from being in this life group. But I am the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It is my will that none should perish. I did not come to condemn the world. I came to seek and save the lost. I came to save the world. And Matthew qualifies because he bears the image of God. And Jesus is saying, I'm not satisfied with him just bearing my image. I want him to be reinstated as a son so that he can have everything that I have. I want him to have the qualifications of a son and a daughter. So you know what we gotta do? Matthew needs rebirth. Matthew needs to be born again. And you know where it's going to start? I'm going to honor this man by entering his home when he graciously invites me. And I'm going to break bread with all of him and his friends and followers. And when Jesus is doing that, when Jesus is present, it changes people's lives. It changed your lives. That's why you're here today. It changed my lives. That's why I'm here today. So I get so excited about this. He goes on to say something so convicting to us as the church. He said, I'm not here to invite outsiders for a city. Or he said, that's bad. That's exactly why he's here. He said, I'm here. <laughs> Dyslexic, there it was. He says, I'm here to invite outsiders. Do you hear that? Hospitality. I'm here to invite outsiders, not coddle insiders. That's what the fairs were wanting. Status quo. Don't break up our game. We got a good thing going here. Don't ruin our thing we've, we've been working on so hard to build now. It's done really well for us. Don't, don't, don't get, and Jesus is like, oh, I'm sorry. You, you, don't, you don't understand the kingdom. I'm not here to coddle insiders. I'm here to love insiders. 
I'm here to call insiders to follow me and walk with me and, and, and do what I do and I will empower you to do it. But I'm definitely not here to call to you because hospitality done Jesus's way is not comfortable. It is not convenient. But listen to me, this is where we get stories that we get to take with us to heaven. Stories like Matthew. Matthew didn't just write a book in the best-selling book of all time that we're preaching from today and that has changed so many lives. Do you know he loved Jesus so much by the end of it for the grace and forgiveness and mercy that he showed him? That tax collecting fraud and schemer was so transformed and so changed by the invitation of Jesus Christ. He went on to die a martyr's death in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus knew that when nobody else knew that. And can I preach for a minute? This, no, let's step out of hospitality for you. Can I encourage you today? Because you deserve some encouragement. I'm encouraging myself right now. God knows the end from the beginning in your story too. God's not working in your life right now from your status quo. He's working from what he knows he designed you for. You understand that? God's not thinking about your last and biggest mistake. Some of you walk in here guilty. Some of you walk in here feeling condemned for whatever reason. Some of you walk in here and you're just beating yourself up for the, the last thing that happened. The last thing that you know hasn't been good for you in your life. Maybe some shame that's came with it, some guilt that's came with it. And can I just lovingly remind you that God knows the end from the beginning? When he shed blood for the forgiveness of your sins and to invite you back, he knew 2,000 years ago, your worst moment. He's not shocked by it. He knew what he was taking on his shoulders when he spilled that blood for you and me. He's not shocked by it. And while everybody on earth, us crazy humans, we tend to get obsessed with people's behavior. That's how we make judgments on people, just their behavior, right? Jesus is way more obsessed with backstory than behavior. Jesus is way more obsessed with what is possible in that broken human being that does not love everything about themselves and is not proud about a lot of the choices that you or I have made. Jesus is going, yeah, but if you will continue to receive my invitation, if you will continue to just keep following me, you're gonna see your heart over time change and change and change. I have to move on. You guys know me. I wanna, I wanna, talk, about, I wanna talk about Ian to end this. This is a precious uh, story and I hope it brings us some permission and some freedom to simplify this whole evangelistic thing this whole being one of Jesus's followers. It is not difficult. You just have to be willing to live a life interrupted. You just have to be willing to live a life of inconvenience sometimes. You have to be willing to be brave enough to get into the heart and get into the lives of some people that on paper you wouldn't choose for yourself. And it will be when you see Jesus because of your invitation, when you see Jesus because of your hospitality, when you see Jesus because of your generous and open arms towards people that least expect you to like them and to be for them, you start to see Jesus softening their heart and being interested and being wooed towards him. It is one of the most fulfilling things you and I will ever get to do on this side of earth. And so about a year and a half ago, a, a kid moved into our town named Ian. He's my son's age and he showed up to school and three years ago we moved. And so my oldest son knows what it's like to be the new kid at school that sits alone at lunch. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That's rough, right? And he saw this kid sitting alone at lunch and he knew he was a new kid. And so, and I love bragging on my son. I love this kid. He just went over and sat with him. 2,500 people at his high school in Texas and this kid's alone and my son went and sat with him. It's a proud dad moment. And then he invited him over to our house. And then he kept coming to our house. And then he would never leave our house. <laughs> and then as time and trust was built, I started to learn about Ian's backstory, not his behavior. He's not a perfect kid, not even close. But I started to learn about his backstory rather than just seeing or hearing about his behavior. And what I learned was he moved from Alabama to Texas because he was in a incredibly abusive home. His, his mom and dad were divorced, his mom's stepfather, so bad that he still hasn't been able to tell us exactly what happened. But he had to come and 
his father, and I'm using a name in code, so it's in Texas, so I'm, right? Because I want to honor him. But his father is really struggling with alcoholism and has been for years. And it is not a much better situation, but it's better than the one he left. Can you imagine being 17? In fact, some of you, that was your story growing up. You were Ian. You are Ian. And I started to realize, oh, that's why you're always at our house. Look, the Brugman family's far from perfect. I could give you a list of things we got to work on. But what we do have in our family, and I give all glory to Jesus Christ, nothing else, is some safety, a safe space in our home. We have love. We have kindness. Those can go a long way to a person that hasn't seen much of that in their life. You know what I'm saying? And Ian has seen very little of that in his life. So we started to learn about that. And my wife is amazing. And she grew up in a really precarious, difficult childhood herself. And so when she gets around kids like that, I mean, I have to get a second job because she will buy them a pink pony if they want. My wife just has this heart because she understands what it's, you know what I'm saying? And so my wife literally right now is like, we have to adopt Ian. He has to come and live with us full time, right? Like that's her. And I'm like, pump the brakes, sweets. Let's, he's got a fan. You know, we just want to work with him. He's here all the time anyways. He basically does live with us. But what happened was we started giving him food. We started giving him shelter. We started treating him like a kid who's our son. It wasn't hard. It's easy. Him and my son just hang out most of the time. But when he's there, I'm high-fiving him. I'm asking him questions. I'm giving him hugs. My wife is doing absurd things for him, taking care of him, washing his clothes. We'll, she'll go to his apartment because his dad will leave for sometimes a week at a time. She'll go to his apartment and stock the place with groceries because he's a 17-year-old kid home alone. That, that isn't hard for us to do. In fact, it's a delight. You think Ian, Ian thinks he's won the lottery with us and I'm sitting there going, I, I'm enjoying this more than you, Ian, because this is what it was supposed to be like. This is what Jesus asked us to do. And it's not hard. You just have to want to do it. And the more you do it, the more you're like, give me more of those stories, Jesus. Give me one more. And I love what Pastor Andy Stanley down in Atlanta says. He says, just do for one what you wish you could do for thousands. We get so caught up in like, I can't be Billy Graham, so I'm just going to you know, hide in the, the back spaces of Christianity. I'm like, no, just do for one person. That's all God's asking. If we all did for one, the world would be taken care of. You don't have to overcome. You don't have to over out resource yourself. It doesn't have to overwhelm you. Just say, give me one Jesus where I can try. And I'm not going to do it perfect like you, but I can try through an invitation and through, through uh, some caretaking, some hospitality. I can try and make a difference in life. So I, I got to wrap up, but y'all, again, I know I'm a talker. Here, here's, here's, wh here's where we're at now, a year and a half into our relationship with Ian. My son is an inviter and every Wednesday night is youth group. And my son loves the kids that are down and out, overlooked, bullied. I, over the last year, something happened where we keep having anywhere from five to 15 teenagers on Wednesday night come to our house after school before youth group, most of which have not been in church. They're going for the first time because of my son's invite. And it's happened every week so much that we just decided, okay, Jesus, we hear you. We hear you. This is one of our ministries. You, you, we, we, we see you. And uh, if I could tell you a bunch of these kids' stories, because I was a youth pastor for a lot of years, so I'm like, tell me your story. These kids think I'm nuts. Tell me your story. And as I've learned these stories, I'm like, oh, my word. Wednesday nights are my now favorite night of the week. I look forward. I'm like, who's coming this week? I text you to school. Who you got coming this week? And he's going to take them all to youth group. But you know what we said? We, we're not the youth pastor, but you know what we could do? We could, we could buy a meal for them all. And now they just come. They love it. They're like, we're having some good, we're having some za, we're having some pizza because like, we got to buy in bulk, right? So we, you know, and so last, this last Wednesday, we bought 120 chicken nuggets and some fries and said, have at it. You know, it doesn't have to break the bank. You guys know what I'm saying? Because the power is not in, in the things you're giving them. The power is in the invitation. The power is in the expression. The power is in the mutual honoring of humanity. And Jesus was our master at this. And he says, guys, don't overcomplicate it. Ask for one, ask for one. Do for one what you wish you could do for the thousands. And, and you will see that you'll start to do it a little more and you a little more. And instead of it being a command that I give you to love one another, it will become a joy. The word command won't even be relevant anymore. 
That's when you've graduated. That's not a command anymore. It's, it's a joy. And now Ian, who grew up with no Christian faith or background, is inviting more people to my house. Why? He feels so comfortable that it's his house now. That's where we've evolved now into this process. I don't know what's gonna happen with Ian 10, 20 years from now, but I do know this. He will never forget the year or two in high school when he moved and he got a new family. He got a second family. He, he'll never forget that. The Brugmans will never forget that. I'm believing Ian and I will be hanging out together in heaven, hugging and talking about good old times when he was a kid. That's, that's, that's it. To wrap this series up, that's the challenge to y'all for city. Just ask, can we do for one what we wish we could do for thousands? It will bring somebody so much hope. One invitation that costs you a little bit. One invitation that's a little uncomfortable could literally change the trajectory like Matthew of somebody's life in the name of Jesus for the glory of Jesus. And it does not require any ounce of ability. All it asks is availability. We all qualify for that. And so Jesus, as we conclude this sermon series, hospitality is one of the uh, chief values of Forest City. As we do that, I pray that this would be a year full of stories. I pray that you would continue to trust us with the Ians. Continue to trust us with them. Whether it's a neighbor, whether it's a kid at our friend's school, whether it's a, an enemy, that's up to you, Jesus. But may we hearken your voice when you're trying to show us who you've put in our life to give that invitation and to, to do our part, to let you do the ultimate part, which is for them to be born again into the kingdom of God. Now, God, as we leave this building until we meet again next week and start a brand new series, God, that's gonna be incredible. I pray that you would bless every single person here, that you would keep them in the grip of your grace, that you would cause your face to shine upon them, that you would be radically gracious to them and their families. Turn your countenance towards every single person in this room. Pay attention to us this week, God. And may we walk out of these doors with a peace that passes understanding that guards our hearts and guards our minds in Christ Jesus. We pray this blessing, Jesus, in your awesome name.